All right, what's going on, everyone? Uh, we are bringing the second segment or second episode of the history, the captive history of Reticulated Pythons. We have Glenn back with us, and this time we are going to jump into something that might be a little closer to home for all of you retic keepers and breeders. Um, we're going to be basically jumping in from the 70s um, up until about right before the, the uh, Lacey Act ban, and it's going to be a good one. I'm excited. Yeah, this is uh, information that I've only read in books and uh, expanded on a little bit. So again, really excited to get into it. Yeah, before we go ahead and bring Glenn on, uh, just want to remind you guys, uh, if you guys are listening on YouTube, hit that like button, the notification if you guys want to be notified when we drop episodes every Friday. And uh, we are more than happy to welcome you into our Patreon community. Um, we have, uh, well, we were going to do a live, but, um, yeah, this is actually being recorded now and irrelevant for when it's released. So I'm going to redact that statement. But anyways, if you want to hop on Patreon, um, uh, we'd love to have you there. We got a great community. Uh, and yeah, Nathan, you got anything else? Not a whole lot. Make sure you're supporting us arc, uh, us arc, Florida and yeah. Enjoy the episode guys. Whether you're just getting into retics or you've been breeding for years, the first place you want to visit is Stewart Design. More and more breeders keep showing up at shows, on Morph Market, and are all over social media. Sometimes it may feel possible to get anyone's attention. Stewart Designs helps small businesses like yours do big things through brand clarity, helping entrepreneurs to start and scale businesses that are easy to know and love. Their work can help any company or industry, but they've done a ton of work for ours. Stewart Design created the brands for US Arc, Canova, Reach Out Reptiles, Coiled, and dozens of other well known reptile breeders. Like many of us, the owner of Stewart Design, Blake, is a keeper and breeder who fell in love with Retix through first working with Garrett Hartle. Although Stewart Design does a lot of corporate work, Blake has a passion for working with people in the reptile industry. Stewart Design can help if you're just getting started or you're ready to take things to the next level. You're struggling to stand out and build your presence online or at shows. You don't want to be like the other guys or get lost in the crowd. And you want to make your own way doing what you love. And also, you have big ideas and know your business is special, but you need help sharing it with the reptile community. If something here resonates with you, reach out to Blake and have a conversation. To learn more or get started, visit stuartdesignbrands.com or call them at 855 855- SD logos. Clear brands own markets. Stuart Design helps create them. If you are in the market for an enclosure for your reticulated python or any other one of your reptiles, Focus Cubed Habitats is your one-stop shop for not only the best looking cages on the market, but also provide amazing features and add-ons to your cages. We partnered with Focus Cubed Habitats because they continue to innovate and change the way we house are animals unlike any other caging company out there. Their cages are designed intelligently and provide the most stylish and secure housing for your animal's comfort and well-being. Visit focuscubedhabitats.com for your animal's caging needs. Again, visit focuscubedhabitats.com for some amazing and stylish enclosures. We also want to thank VivTech Products for being an affiliate sponsor of the Retic Lounge. Stop by VivTech Products for the best UV spectrum lighting on the market that will enhance and improve your snake's overall well-being and health. Visit VivTechProducts.com and use the code RETICLOUNGE23 today for 15% off. Again, visit VivTechProducts.com and use our affiliate code RETICLOUNGE23 today for 15% off. Looking for the perfect accessories for your hatchlings or juvenile retics? Look no further than Heli Guy Serpents. Our sponsor, Chris Sexton, is coming in hot with an amazing 3D printer, creating top-notch perches and other caging accessories for your beloved pets. Enrich your retics environment with their high-quality products. Use our promo code TRL10 for a 10% discount on your purchase. Visit them today at heliguyserpents.com and start giving your pets the best. Heliguy Serpents, the premier source for 3D printed caging accessories. 
Again, that's www.heliguyserpents.com and use our promo code TRL10 for 10% off all of your 3D printed accessories today. Yeah, let's go ahead and get Glenn on. There he is. Ah, thank you for Welcome having me back. Welcome back, buddy. I'm honored. You Welcome letting back. Letting me come back, that's a big deal. Thank you. Right. I mean, typically with your behavior, I wouldn't, but you have information that we all need. You know. One of those characters. Right. <laughs> um, so let me ask you, Glenn, uh, at, did you get a chance to watch the first episode that you Absolutely not. No. put out? No? No. Yeah, I'm not to watch it. I'm not yeah, that kind of person I, either. I would never do that. No, I had to suffer through it just living it, and I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> right. I'm not that much of a glutton for punishment. Yeah, we really had to drag him back here tonight, guys. Yeah. So, um, I will say that the, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive, and a lot of people are excited for this episode. So I'm excited to uh, jump into it. Uh, if you want a condensed introduction version of yourself in case someone is just jumping into this one, didn't do the last one, um, so my name is Glenn McClellan. Basically, I am a herpetoculture enthusiast um, with a background in biology. For my senior thesis, I explored the dwarf and super dwarf subspecies Malayo python reticulatus championis. And as part of my research, I examined the captive history. And so tonight we are going to do part two of three examining uh, that subject. Yeah, sweet. Great intro. Short and Thank sweet. You. And... Just oh. like I like it. <laughs> All right. So are we, are we ready to jump in? Oh. Oh, what? Oh, we're not even sharing the screen yet. Sorry. No, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm rolling in. <laughs> All right. Now. Oh, wait, no, we're still not. I need to click buttons. <laughs> All right. I'm not a YouTuber. There we go. Okay. <laughs> You're about to be. Oh, what's up, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Bro, man. Oh, I hate that so much with a burning passion. All right. Well, we've already got your name. We already know this is part two, so let's jump in. Yes, sir. So I just wanted to follow up a little bit on the previous episode. Uh, several people had reached out to me um, saying very nice things after the first episode. So I wanted to thank them. Uh, one of the people who actually I had initially contacted for information regarding the captive history reached out to me and said thank you. So that was a very big honor. Um, and then the second point I wanted to hit on was I had uh, briefly discussed my uh, fruit fly research and that hasn't been published Um I think there's probably a few presentations on the topic that have my name attached to them that you could find if you're really interested. But um, I just wanted to clear the air on that. Um, if you're looking for a published paper, that does not exist. And then as we get into this episode, compared to the last episode, really none of the people who we discussed are alive, whereas today they are alive. Um, and they're standing in not only the captive reptile community, but um, really their standing in the world is not always as um, stand-up citizens, perhaps we should say. So I don't want anyone to construe this information as a condemnation or a commendation of them. This is simply the history as I understand it. So um, please do not make this a defense or an attack on anyone, please. I save that for my private phone calls with Lucas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right. Getting aggressive here tonight. Uh, so um, just following up on the 1700s to 1940s, we really have the introduction of reticulated pythons to the West from the 1940s to the 1970s. Um, you start to see more of them in America and specifically in the zoological setting. And then tonight we're going to start discussing the reticulated pythons in captivity uh, from the 1970s to the 90s, where they initially started to be brought in for the pet trade. And we see the very first morphs. And then in the 90s to 2000s, we see this huge craze of um, base mutations being imported and proving to be heritable. The 2000s to 2015, which was the world's first craze, and then 2015 to the present, which will be the next episode where we really discuss the 
uh, rediscovery of dwarf and super dwarf reticulated pythons. Awesome. Sweet. Okay. So, um, like the last episode, this first slide really discusses setting the groundwork. Um, without knowing the proper history, I don't think you can fully appreciate the animals we have. So that's why when I discuss someone like Albert Seva and his cabinet of curiosities, I'm doing that for a reason. Um, so first, to understand why we have reticulated pythons in captivity, why they're so popular, we really have to understand where her pediculture began. Um, and its modern form, if you can even call it that, really began in the 50s. People would bring um, in native species that they captured, so stuff like garter snakes, king snakes, gopher snakes, various skink species. I mean, what kind of um, reptiles would you guys catch in your backyard and keep for a week or whatever? Ring yeah. Garter Ring. snakes. Uh, there's rubber boas out here. So <sighs> I used to flip stones in my neighborhood all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, keep them in your house for a week or whatever, and then let them go. So that was kind of the very, very early days of her pediculture. Now I'm too scared. I don't blame you, to be honest. <laughs> we have a lot of rattlesnakes where I live, so if I were to go field herping, it would be more likely that I encounter a rattlesnake than right. a California king snake. So Yeah, that, we, we have the same problem. <laughs> yeah, we live in a very similar uh, climate, so. Yep. And I know how much it costs to get airlifted out. So I, I know like someone that got bit last year trying to show his son. Yeah, that's, that's just like that's that's how it happens every time. Yeah. Like and that, ladies and gentlemen, is how trauma at childhood happens. Let me show you how I can handle this wild rattlesnake. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. Um, <laughs> Let's get into these pimped out turtle tubs. Yes. So, um, so awesome. <laughs> this is, it reminds me a lot of the pet rock craze, but this predates it. So in magazines, especially. I was going to say it reminded me of Florida, but. Uh, the modern day Florida? <laughs> no. 70s Florida. It's not like I'm moving there in two months or whatever. But uh, <laughs> regardless, um, there would be ads in magazines for little children to get baby readier sliders. Um and then you could keep them in these little turtle lagoons is what they would call it. And they're just horrific conditions for an animal. But it has started. a palm tree. I don't it's know what paradise. you're talking about. Dude, that's more enrichment than a ball python tub. <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> the views and opinions there. expressed by Glenn McClellan on the Retic Lounge <laughs> do not necessarily reflect the views of Lucas and <laughs> <laughs> the baseline of animal welfare. Oh, Throw man. a stick in its cage. Just, <laughs> just one. Just, Single yeah, stick. Just a stick. See the light Start of with a twig. It'll roll it around. I wonder why my snake hates me. <laughs> it's enrichment, right? <laughs> yeah, it biting you is enrichment. <laughs> and then posting it online. But that's how some people made a career. Regardless, we are going to be discussing things that actually matter. So the onset of her pediculture really can be defined by the horrible keeping of animals. Luckily, some people today have learned how to improve the care. So I am very thankful for them. And I'm very thankful for those who share their knowledge um, and allow us to reap the benefits of their hard work. So we have these very antiquated ads for turtles. Um, and a lot of people kept turtles like this and they would die because they came in the size of dimes and didn't have access to proper heating and lighting, proper care, proper diets. So they were really viewed as disposable pets. And the modern snake keeping can really be um, brought back all the way to albino corn snakes. Um, this is really the first snake that I can recall that had a mutation that was really worked with in captivity. Um, and this dates all the way back to 1953, which is crazy. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. So the morph craze started. Yeah. Um, it, I think corn snakes are cool. So. Yeah. yeah that's uh, when I first discovered like pet snakes in like, you know, early elementary school. Uh, I remember going online and seeing different morphs of corn snakes. So that was like my first introduction to any color mutation. Yeah. 
And when I say morph, uh, just to clarify, um, I'm describing heritable phenotypic mutations, just so that's out of the way. So instead of saying that every time, uh, if I call something a morph, it's very pedantic, but that matters to some people. So here nor there, let's carry on. Um, so in 1959, the first uh, amelanistic heterozygotes were produced. And then when they were bred back to each other in 1961, the very first albino corn snakes were hatched. So how many years ago was that? 60 years ago? So that's crazy. And you can still walk into nearly every Petco or PetSmart in the country and find an albino corn snake. Oh, yeah. There's someone who will buy it, including me. That's pretty cool. Now you can even buy them with two heads. <laughs> really? I don't, I've never seen one actually for sale. I don't know. Here nor there. So really, when we look at the origins of modern herpeticulture, it goes all the way back to albino corn snakes and then um, the things that people were bringing in from the wild. Okay, next slide. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Here we go. So now when you really want to talk about the morph craze as we understand it today, that's albino Burmese. There is no discussion on it. That is full stop, period. Albino corn snakes are cool, but it does not have the draw that an albino Burmese has. I mean, yeah. how cool is an albino Burmese? They are awesome. Not as cool as my albino corn snake. <laughs> yeah, okay, nerd. But still, albino Burmese... They're a stunning animal. Yeah. They made it into um, National Geographic, which I think is just absolutely insane. They made so, it onto Britney Spears. We are we can't all that we can't all be that lucky. So good for that snake. <laughs> it was I think it was Doc Antle who uh get, who did that performance for her. Okay. Hmm. I think. Yeah, I I'm sure I, I'm sure that's easily fact checked. So keep talking, I'll I'll look it up. Yes, sir. So there is a very long, interesting history of the albino Burmese python and how they came to America. Um, a lot of the stories and a lot of the stories in the books like Stolen World and Lizard King tell one story. And then when you listen to Tom Crutchfield um, discuss it in his recent interview on really a Python radio's Herp history, he tells a different story. So for those who want to hear it from the horse's mouth, I recommend go listen to that interview, listen to how he tells it, um, and then, you know, make your decision from there. Um, regardless of what the actual truth is, it's a very interesting story. But in essentially the details everyone can agree on, Tom Crutchfield was the first person in the U.S. to import albino Burmese pythons from a Thai pet dealer named Mr. Deng. Um, Mr. Deng's albino Burmese python was featured in the March 1981 issue of National Geographic. Um, oh, fun fact. I don't know if you guys know this, but Jay Brewer actually, I think, was on the cover of Nat Geo um, for, I think he would caught a rock fish. I don't know. But okay. How he was my age. Oh, no shit. So, like, yeah. <laughs> That's a tease. Yeah. So, fun fact. yeah, Doc Antle, Britney Spears with the tiger. So, yeah sweet it yeah, was part of that performance yep same performance that's same so cool. outfit apparently i was smarter than i know the <laughs> <Go> bar <laughs> quick hide your messages yeah <laughs> those are our messages so uh, yeah. just have to blur <laughs> out Jamie's. have to blur out all the slurs and stuff uh, from 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 lucas mostly what <laughs> you know um, group chats where we blow off some steam <sighs> sure <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so pretty quickly after that one of the albino burmese came in from tom crutchfield one of them made it to bob clark bob clark is going to be a name you hear time and time again in this mm -hmm. story he's who's really, that um he's this little known guy from oklahoma city i don't know if you've known him um but yeah. i For still you. want to talk to bob i haven't you haven't met bob I've called him two or three times, um, but he's always been busy. And I don't mm -hmm. know um, how many people work for him. So I understand it. And I know there's a lot of people, but I'd still like to get if in contact you, with if him. If you make your way out to Arlington and ARBC, he's always there. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised at how uh, personable he is. Yeah, very he, he personable. He was very nice he's, when I spoke with him. Yeah, he's very pleasant. 
I just haven't had a, a long phone call, so I'd love to talk to him. But so if anyone can make that happen, let me know. I'd also like to talk to Tom Crutchfield. So if anyone can make like, that happen, like Lucas said, just fly out to Arlington. We'll both be there. <sighs> there you go. I'm considering it. Probably not. But... Maybe maybe you can convince him to sit down. Yeah, that's Nathan. True. Do you need water? Maybe. Okay. It's been a long day. <laughs> Keep going, Glenn. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, so uh, Bob Clark was, I believe, the first to actually hatch albino Burmese in captivity. That was in the summer of 1986. And then he and Tom Crutchfield split the profits from that. Um, I actually have one of Tom Crutchfield's old price sheets right here where he was selling a pair of um, albino Burmese pythons for $7,500. Can you show that to the camera so people can look, yeah. see what it looks like? This was in February and March of 1992. That's amazing. Dude, that was before I was born. Wait, it was when? March? Uh, February and March of 92. Oh, so that was from when I was born, February 92. Okay, geezer. <laughs> so if you zoom in there, you can see what I was talking about. But there's a lot of really interesting stuff on these price lists. Um, so, and... For those of you who don't know, um, in the early days of reptile keeping in the 80s, 90s, and then even the early 2000s, a lot of business was done on price lists where you would get onto a certain breeder's uh, mailing list, and they would send you what they had available. And then if you wanted something, you'd send a check back. If you wanted photos, sometimes they wouldn't give you that, or you'd have to pay to have Polaroid shipped out to you. So... Uh, when someone wants 12 photos of the snake, 12 photos of the parents, photos of them locked up, photos of the female giving birth. So that's why we still see fights about it to this day? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Good to know. Okay. Good good times. Like just yeah. the process of being able to like get the picture of a possible snake you'll buy took like a month. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. <laughs> now you're seeing them come out of the egg. Yeah. Now the tire kickers would be having a hernia if they had right. to do that. Oh, tire kickers. How horrible. Like, I've never done that. I wish um, someone would do that, like, full-time, very maliciously. <laughs> I, Dude, I, I, I have spoken outwards about breeders who complain about, quote-unquote, tire kickers, but I'm not going to go into that rant. Yeah. I mean, I understand it's very frustrating, but it's there not. is an element of humor to it. It's not frustrating. You're in sales. You're not going to make them all. Just yeah. shut up. Give them the info. Move on. So, you know, old time tire kickers, I guess, would be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they did it. I'm sure they still did it. That would be something we could talk to uh, Bob Clark and Tom Crutchfield about. But nevertheless, it was a different world. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Gotcha. I'm going to need a uh, deposit to send you these Polaroids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so um, one of the things I'm very interested in is localities. Uh, we hear the term mainland reticulated python thrown around a lot, and technically that term does have merit. The Indochinese Peninsula is also called mainland Southeast Asia. So it is a proper descriptor. Um, but when you talk about mainland reticulated pythons, that's not specific to where in that peninsula they came from or the islands around there. Yeah, we're talking about a snake that has one of the widest ranges. You know, the widest. Yeah. So that's what she said. Awesome. <laughs> God, you wish. <laughs> Nathan wishes. Jamie wishes. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> You can't film these late at night. <laughs> I'm just done by this point. Glenn's going to get us canceled for something we haven't even made yet. I'll, I'll take the heat on that one. I'll have to tell you stories off air of stuff. Of yeah, stuff. I just, yeah. I just hope no one finds my internet use from middle school oh. that's horrific Jeez. <laughs> all right this is getting dark back to it some of, <laughs> some of whose impacts are still uh reverberating today but first name he reads is bangkok on the next slide 
<laughs> unrelated. <laughs> Not where I spent my summer. So, um, <laughs> prior to and during the 1980s, most of the imported reticulated pythons came from Bangkok, as Lucas uh, decided to interrupt me and interject with that, uh, came from Bangkok, Thailand, or central western Malaysia. At some point, we may need to pull up a map for those of you who are geographically challenged, like myself. Um, but when we look at those very early reticulated pythons that were imported, that's where they came from. I have a better idea to save me time on editing. Pause the video right now and go ahead and search for Malaysia and follow along. <laughs> <laughs> Just Google Bangkok. Right. <laughs> I mean, I can throw it up, but it's going to be kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah. Go ahead. Next bullet point. Okay. <laughs> um, and then by the mid 1990s, most of the imported reticulated pythons came from Indonesia, specifically Sumatra. Um, in a little bit, we will be looking at the different exportation laws because that really influences why we have the snakes that we have. Um, this gets very important and very interesting when we look at the snakes that are considered dwarfs and super dwarfs. Um, it's a common misconception that there's only those seven when really there's probably thousands of yeah. them that are smaller but because of importation laws we don't have them yeah i would encourage you like go to kalatoa island like on google maps and then just zoom out person no 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 google maps um and then like go east and start zooming in and you'll find islands half the size of kalatoa that are right off bigger islands with retakes on them yeah i'll, I'll this is a bit of a tangent, but um, reticulated python's dispersal ability is insane. Um, do you guys know what Krakatoa was? I don't know why I've heard the term before. Yeah, I was going like to say I the term know. sounds familiar, but I know nothing. Yeah. So there are, I think, in today's time, there are four Krakatoa islands. I don't know what it used to be previously, but one of those islands contains a volcano called Anak Krakatoa. In, I believe, 1883, um, there was a massive explosion from that volcano. Okay. It was the loudest sound ever recorded in human history. Just this massive volcanic eruption. And then I think within 12 years, they found a reticulated python on that island. And then within 30, they had a breeding population on three of them. Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. So, and it was 12 miles from the nearest island. Damn. So, it. I wonder are... if, I wonder if they're on uh, Malaysia's invasive species list. Uh, they're on Puerto Rico's. <laughs> What's crazy is that there's like that, that... Puerto Rican reticulated no, there, python. No, no, hundred percent. There's Puerto. I've I've made that joke before, but it's really not a joke. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's videos of it. It's crazy. And wasn't that some <laughs> so we have drug we have... dealer that released yeah. all of his mm -hmm. snakes? It's yeah. the same thing as uh, Pablo Escobar's hippos in Brazil. So we uh -huh. have uh, the U.S. quote unquote has invasive retics. <laughs> Do we even count them? <laughs> It's like Washington, D.C. They don't really count. We'll take their tax dollars, but no representation. We'll, we'll go toss some bounty at them. I, here nor there. <laughs> that was wild. By the mid-1990s. <laughs> by the mid-1990s, most of the imported reticulated pythons into the United States came from Indonesia. Is that better, Lucas? Uh, that was great. Thank you. I'm very glad. Um, so back to what I was saying, we have to look at the importation laws to really understand why we have the reticulated pythons that we do. And then at the very end of the episode, we'll talk about why we can't import reticulated pythons anymore. Um, so you can go on to the next slide. Okay, so Lucas asked me this a couple weeks ago, um, and I <laughs> totally dodged answering this. So Instead, I decided to surprise them live um, with Yay. sharing all of the publicly known localities that have been or are still currently in the U.S. And then as another pedantic note, island races is probably a better way to describe them, but most people know it as localities. Um, I could sit here and list all 20-something and then say Ambon type, Bali type, but I'm too lazy. You know what I mean. Yeah. 
So um, for those of you who are listening to audio, I have been able to find Ambon, Bali, Bantaying, Sulas, Sulawesi, Borneo, Bhutan, Central Maluku's, Halmahera, Jampea, Java, Kalatoa, Kurumpa, Kurumpas, sorry, you should say both, uh, Kaiwadi, uh, Madu, Malaysian, Mindanao, uh, Slayer, Saram, uh, Sula, Sulawesi, bad habit, uh, Sumatra, Timbalongans, and Ternate Island, reticulated pythons. Am I missing anything? Yes, you are missing the larger Philippine island where the tribals came from. Uh, what is it? But do we actually have those in the U.S.? Tribals? Like a pure, yeah. A pure one? Yep. A pure yeah, Philippine absolutely. one? Yeah, Rodney had uh, three in his collection. He sent two out. He has one right now, I believe, that he just got back from Andrew. And uh, I know Sean has one of those. And there's a couple other people that have them as well. Okay. So there you go. We do have Philippines. I'm very interested how he got the Philippines because. Um, yeah, that's one of the ones that couldn't legally export. Yeah. So my guess is that they probably came through Indo. Um, most yeah. things came through Indo and it's a lot easier to do it that way than. So, yeah, I, I don't have Philippines. <laughs> I think by the time they make it to the U.S., they're technically legal. Well, that because if they were relief. legally exported from Indonesia, you should be in the clear. It's okay. the same thing as all of the um, farm hatched green tree pythons. Everyone knows they were wild caught. Right. Right. I don't know if the um, farm that Cameron had is still running, but here nor there, there's still a lot of wild caught green tree pythons and Boland's pythons that are being imported. Yep. Uh, mislabeled by some people that i complain to lucas about in private quite frequently so <laughs> once again here nor there um so once again for the audio only listeners in 1992 the trade of wild reticulated pythons was banned from thailand um so those earlier ones that were brought in prior to and during the 1980s came from bangkok so after that there would have been no more thai reticulated pythons and i should also note that the locality information with those animals probably was not known or they didn't care it just would have been thrown into a big box labeled reticulated python and they were all so mean anyway that no one really cared they were mostly used for the skin trade back then right still still yeah yeah. i know there was uh i think it's chris sweet he's a guy who's really good with uh uh cobras and stuff he lives Mm -hmm. over in bangkok and he's outside all the time and he posts videos of the wild yeah just uh, in the bushes waiting for cats right um yeah they're beautiful i do like them a lot yeah they're very cool um so uh i don't i forgot where we're going for that 1986 philippine government (laughs) banned their exports so i have no idea how they made it and i want to ask rodney because that's probably a cool story just don't share it. I don't. I. I don't think it's illegal, right? I don't know. I mean, I. I. I do know that. Like, so his stance has changed on it because I'm very. Public oh, that's about... not what I'm asking. That's what a you... whole different story. And no, no, no. I'm talking about like. I, I mean, like he. He even was like, "Hey, you know, you. You said this publicly as Philippine. He's like, just to let you know, they, they weren't allowed to be import. But now he doesn't care. So I don't know." No. But I would think that if they made it to Indonesia and then we legally imported it from Indonesia, then that's not on us. That's whoever brought it into yeah. Indonesia. I think that's, I vaguely remember, I think I talked about that with a notable importer that once they made it, once they are legally exported, you're in the clear. There you go. But I don't, I don't know. I don't do that. So <laughs> don't take that as legal advice. So. It would be the Philippine government coming after you anyway, and if you weren't the one to do it, and if you don't even know who did it, I don't right. know what. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> and then Vietnam banned the wild harvest in 1998, and then since 2015, no live exports from Malaysia. Excuse me. That wouldn't matter for the U.S. anyway, but for um, the EU who can still import no more animals from Malaysia. Another thing that I'm also interested in is to see the progression of how we've kept animals in the hobby. So I believe the very first, what? Sorry, I was going to say, you're going to, you're going to go through three decades of, (laughs) until you see a little progress. (laughs) I do log on to the retech nation and tell me if there even is progress. Exactly. Uh, Apparently keep it. 
I don't understand how keeping an 18 foot snake in a six foot enclosure is logical. But, I mean, there, I'm sure there were many problems that arose. Um, actually, if you read the description on the very bottom left photo, it says something to the effect of how snakes do better with a very bare enclosure with no um, stuff in it. With no, I'll, I'll read it. It says the fiber gl- uh, fiberglass cage is probably the easiest of all cages. Uh, it has the further advantage of providing no rough spots for snakes to rub its nose on. Given the chance, snakes will often rub all the skin off the tips of their nose nah, it may have been extended on the next page I, I don't remember i pulled that from an ebay ad but that was from um oh e. ross allen's yeah oh, yeah yeah uh yeah uh anyways keep going I'll look it was forward. from e ross allen's book uh who we watched the video of last time wrestling the anaconda and the alligator quite the show mm-hmm. it was very entertaining <laughs> So these something. were his cages. They were fiberglass, really the first commercially available snake cages. Um, and that and book, still being used in, in some collections. I've seen them personally. I like them. They're cool looking. They are cool looking. Um, that's why I included the Neodesha cages, because a lot of people are still very interested in them. Um, a lot of people, the old timers in the green tree python community speak very, very highly of them. It, they seem to get the job done, so you know who my, cares. My favorite yeah. claim. My favorite claim here is uh, this cage is easily cleaned and provides no places for mites to hide. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's probably true. Do mites try to hide? I feel like they're just openly on the snake. <laughs> I no. Never mind. <laughs> I'm just gonna make something come. To read I, I'm proud of your self control there, Gwen. <laughs> I'm I'll tell you guys off the air what I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, Neo Deshi cages, um, I feel like in just the last couple of years have piqued a lot of people's interests again. Yeah. They're very interesting design wise. Um, I believe Bob Clark still uses them. And mm-hmm. one of the photos that we'll see later on, you can see um, the Neo Deshi cages in the background the uh the front of those like the the glass or whatever like mm-hmm. is very f- not like super flexible but it's not i don't know i wonder what it's made out of because it's it, i don't know when i've seen it it's uh yeah a lot thinner than what we use I, they're cool so. yeah and it's inter it's only it's kind of cave-like if you think about it how it has a wide opening Go. front and then yeah yeah I like that. I'm, yeah. And I mean, you, you look at fashion and like old things tend to come back, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know, maybe shaped enclosures like that will come yeah. back. Yeah. And call Ashley and Steven, see if they'll make that for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I know they will. I don't. He, Steven yeah, is a wizard. He, he could do everything. Yeah. He's, he's Shout crazy. out to Focus Cube. Yeah. They, my spider loves this new enclosure. Thank you guys. Um, most people don't know that Neodesha were made in other form factors. So that's why I included a photo of, I pro- that's probably a green tree Python set up there for. Um, yeah. It looks like an Aru box. type. <sighs> okay. Nerd. I'm just, <laughs> you can see it. It's got the white. No, anyways. Those are cool uh, little enclosures. They almost look like a retro TV or something yeah. like that. So maybe someone can bring those back. And then after the Neodesha, we really saw the advent of vision cages and a lot of the more seasoned people in the retic world still use vision cages. And um, that's as advanced as we've gotten. It's not the cage that matters. It's how you do it and how much room you give the animal. Right. So, Not the, the size of the boat. Mo- oh, wow. Whatever mm, that's so close, Nathan. Ah! So close, Nathan. <laughs> oh, it hurts. You, you almost finished it. <laughs> so I'm. Um, um, I use the photo from Metcalf Reptiles, who um, Aaron's very nice person. I know Lucas. I think you sold him your wild caught Kalatoa male, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was great nice to person. work with. Real yeah. cool to talk on the phone. Mm-hmm. Um, those might have been Travis Kubis's old cages. Okay. Because if you look at the video or the old videos of Travis Kubis, he had obviously a lot of vision cages because everyone used them. And he had a lot, or he inherited a lot of Kubis's collection when he got out. So 
Yeah, I'm actually repping. So Legacy just actually scooped up 36 vigil cages with a collection of animals. So cool. I mean, they're they're still yeah they are out there. Mm-hmm. Triple L uses them, and I don't know how long Triple L has had them. So they are you know road worn and tested. Oh yeah, yeah. one they thing don't, they don't die. They yeah. don't. If you can find a used vision cage in good condition, you know, with an appropriate size animal, those cages last you a lifetime. Yeah, there's a reason everyone uses them. There's nothing wrong with them just because they're older. It's It goes back to giving your animal what it needs, and that depends on what's inside the cage, not the actual cage itself. Right. Yeah. So. You can All go right. The next. This is my favorite slide. Yes, this is also probably my favorite topic to speak on. So the introduction of phenotypic morphs or phenotypic mutations or morphs into reticulated pythons. So we saw this beginning in the 1980s. Um, Most people know the tiger reticulated python as coming from Carl Herman and, oh gosh, I want to say Al Krizan. I don't remember his first name. That sounds right. Um, is it Herman Curzon? Most people know it as Herman. They forget Curzon, but they're credited with the first tiger reticulated python, but it predates them back to the 80s. And there were actually a lot of tiger reticulated pythons that came in. Um, Fluffy there with Bob Clark and with the Neodesha cages in the background. I think she was in one of the first litters of tiger retics. Um, I think the Baldagos might have even had their own tiger retic. I don't remember. But we talked about that. I thought that there was a separate Baldogo tiger. Probably. It wasn't only Herman and Crisant. So uh, just kind of interesting. And then they hadn't been found in the wild for like 20 years. Um, and they were recently found again. So yeah, it's one of the, it's one of those mutations that you can easily see thriving in the wild. Yeah. Like anatheristic. So yeah. Um, on Speaking the, of. Um, yes, sir. That. That's a Malaysian or a Suma- Sumatran. Sumatran, yeah. That that probably, like as far as like wild type goes, and I know it's endotheristic, but you know it's pretty commonly found in the wild for places that have them. That's probably my favorite snake. I mean, you could say that about any of these. You, you snakes, said so. that about uh, Chris McVicker's aunt. Uh, Anna no, Rito. I'm t- I'm I'm t- God, I hate both of you. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean. Don't contradict yourself and we won't call you out. How about this? I actually saw the, that picture for the first time after that episode that I said Chris's was my favorite. We're going to have to put out a new clip, Lucas's new favorite snake. There you Lucas go. Bagnara exposed. Bagnara exposed. <laughs> Liar. Hashtag drama. <laughs> uh, anyways, that's a beautiful snake. And that's from Sumatra? I, I believe so. You'd, um, it's on Jacob's Facebook, so you can confirm with him. Yeah. But um, anatheristic has been found in all three subspecies. Yep. Um, something that's interesting is in this book, the general care and maintenance of Burmese pythons, including notes on other large constrictors by Philippe de something, whose name I can't pronounce, and I feel ashamed for not being able to pronounce that because he's really the forefather of... Um, bioactive enclosures Sweet. Um, he briefly discusses reticulated pythons at the very end and discusses morphs and this book was published in 91 so this was before bob clark's albino which we'll get to later but he says other forms include silver retics with light uh very light silvery gray heads which in my mind is an anatheristic yeah, it's very possible. And then you he, know, you know, they used to call the uh, when they produce the layer anneries, the mercury line. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I thought that that was a pretty cool name. Wait, no, wait, oh, wait, no, those were jams. What? The mercury line. Okay, As there's. Far- if, if, I mean, at least from what I've seen on the Retic Nation dating back, I see people talking about Solaire Mercury lines. Okay. I know why. Um, mercury has been used to describe a couple different Retics. There was an anatheristic one, anatheristic type or looking like one that didn't prove out, I think, and it was likely a birth defect. And then Greg... Um, 
what's his last name? I'm blanking. Bryant. Thank you, Brian. Wonderful man. Thank you, Greg, for speaking with me on the phone for so long. You were actually a joy to speak with. Um, I believe his jampeas, which he got from Sean DeBoard, which were anathristics, but he called them the pastel line. DeBoard okay. called them the pastel line. Bryant called them the mercury line. Got it. But then there were some slayers that I think were at least heterozygous for anathristic because Chris McVicker has some of Bryant's that have proved anathristic, but they're all crosses. Yeah. There we go. All right. <laughs> Dropping it down. That's like a history within a history. <laughs> <laughs> and then back to what I was going to say. Um, he also says that there are dwarf forms from Timor, which is kind of interesting because um, that would have predated the Jampionis importation by a couple years. Okay. Um, and then on the left, we kind of went in a horrible order, but on the left is, <laughs> yeah, Poison I almost Ivy. skipped the next Nathan. Um, you guys know who poison Ivy was? Yeah. Famous snake, um, from nerd. I believe she was a Sumatran. You could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but she threw some very weird looking babies, um, called the Ivy line. She yep. was originally bred to the wild caught anthrax male to make the first granite backs and I believe 2004. Does that sound right? Uh, uh, I couldn't tell I you. I don't that. know on the I, anthrax lineage. Yeah. I was following and knew the information up until you mentioned that anthrax pairing. Okay. Um, I have it in my notes somewhere, but um, poison ivy is a calico reticulated python. That is a very, very common morph in retics, but in the 30 years that they've been in captivity, no one has been able to prove it out as heritable. Um, I always uh, equate it to vitiglo in humans. So the thing that Michael Jackson ostensibly had. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, that makes sense. It arises in adulthood. There was a ball python that experienced something very similar to, to that. If you go on Ralph Davis's YouTube channel and go back like 10 years... You can find it. How much time do you have on your hand? <laughs> no, I watched that video when it went out. So, oh. and then I'm just me. So I remember it. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that ball pythons even. Yeah, that's the first I've heard of that. But... I mean, it, it, nowhere near as drastic as reticulated pythons, but the same thing yeah. as an adult drastically changed colors. So no I'll one has that... been. Yeah. I'll say Calico probably fascinates me the most just because we know the least about it. Uh, we actually do know a lot about it and it's not heritable. <laughs> I mean, as as far as just like, I mean, do we understand the biological components and that are driving it? Nope. But I mean, I guess that's what I'm talking about. When we don't know how to replicate it and we know that it's not inheritable, what's going on? Lucas Bagnera exposed. Liar. Drama. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I don't know. Something. It's Calico. That's all you need to know. <laughs> it's Calico. And you could be the first to prove it out. No, shut up. <laughs> Yeah. Don't don't get joked into that 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 scam if someone tries yeah. to tell you uh that you can prove out calico. People have been trying forever. That's why yeah, I should But Lucas, you can do it. Yeah, you can be the first one for $5,000. I'm signing off. Um so th these were very early morphs that came in um Calico came in, I believe, during the 90s, still never proved out. You can just find a lot of them in the wild today. Tigers came in in the 19, 1980s and 1990s, and then anneries would have came in at least in the 90s. All right. Next slide. Let's go to the fun stuff. The fun stuff. Albino, Nathan's favorite topic. Um, there's the a lot most of... confusing topic. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I'm sorry. So I'll try to break this down in a way that makes sense if it doesn't stop me excuse me um so i believe the very first well i'll backtrack there was a newspaper photo i believe of a dead albino found and that would have been in either the very early 90s or the late 80s i'm forgetting but there was a photographed one and it was dead um pete call who he's done a lot he's another name um he imported what was a T negative albino form. Uh, we'll see what that turned out to be later in the next slide. But from okay. central peninsular Malaysia, a lot of the albino types came from Malaysia, but in more recent years, they found a lot in Sumatra for some reason. 
So, have you seen some of the new Sumatra albinos yeah, that have been coming cool. out? They yeah. look insane. Yeah, it's have like you a seen neon the one from, orange? Uh, the Philippines? No. Oh, it's cool. I'll find that and send it to you. It's cool. Um, and then I think I briefly. Oh no, this was off the air. But Bob Clark's lavender phase came in April of ninety four through Anson Wong, um, the Lizard King, famous animal smuggler, um, very interesting man with a very interesting history. Weird. Now that 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 would be like the ultimate reptile interview right there, dude. I would be like we could, we could do Hank Molt though. We can even do. Oh, uh, you okay? Yeah, Hank Molt might edge out Anson <laughs> Wong. I would say we could probably do an entire episode on just each of those. Yeah. Without even cool. interviewing them to talk about the history. I mean, the history of reptiles in captivity is smuggling, so it's nothing yeah. new. No, absolutely. It's still going on today. I, that's, Hank, yeah, that's, Hank Moult's <laughs> not alive, though, is he? I think he is, but I cannot find any way to contact him. Because he's... Okay. Oh, never mind. Anyways. Um, so I think he is still alive. I'd love to talk to him just because that's... A fascinating source of history and then uh kevin imported another lavender like one too i don't know what happened to that i can't find out what happened to it do you guys know no mm -hmm. idea um you know who would probably know is andy deets he would probably be a good person to ask that question too so here nor there um and then as far as i know there's at least 12 forms of heritable albinism in reticulated pythons um for people who don't know it was very um, i always like to say it was kismet that the lavender phase was the one that was found for bob clark because that allowed for purple albinos white albinos and lavenders to be kept um if it was only one of the other colored phases we would have only had that single color phase but because it was lavender we had the other three it's fate. so yes it was fate um so because of fate we had purples whites and lavenders all three can be called clark strain albinos and then you have indocarmel mocha rennick ghost rest in peace ben rennick mm -hmm. have you guys watched any of the trial videos from Lindley? not anything from the trial oh, no i've seen weird. like tiny clips but like nothing no do they have like a documentary style thing about the trial itself because i've heard i've heard and seen plenty on you know just the story but i mean they did the dateline thing but i don't know yeah a trial no it was so. it were was more guys, just on the story of what happened were you in the reptile or were you tuned into the reptile community when that happened yeah i, I yeah i mean i i was looking into retakes kind of like not keeping them at the time and i i think i already had my first super dwarf at the time so, um, but I, I do remember that being a very, um, I, I was in the groups prior to having my first retake for, I think two to three years. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's just where I, I heard of it. Didn't know who he was or anything. I, I was at a show with, or I, they, I was at a show that they vended and very, I remember Ben was very nice and Lindley, very unassuming. I knew who she was. Um, so she was someone who was involved and then to find out all those years later that she was probably the one that murdered him was insane no, and horrible. It's, yeah. I mean, literally the, the scam of the century um, with, you know, the donations, everything that happened yeah. for a very nice person too. So it's, it's a shame. Yeah. That, that's a major loss for the reptile community. Yeah. Just a shame because everyone thought it was a robbery. That's right. What it was horrible regardless um rennick ghost a very cool mutation travis warren is carrying on um ben rennick's um legacy with that mutation so that's um very noble for lack of a better word of travis to do that because um, i think ben rennick's story should be shared uh and then you have fulsham caramel albino a melanistic blonde albino type 3 albino sharp strain albino and honey blast albino Cool. Let's jump to the next one. If I can. Oh, so you can, let's you get in. Yeah, let's, let's see if see. you can actually do let's this. Let's see, guys. We got this. Maybe. Um, so as a preface, this is a video from Bob Clark posted uh, quite a few years ago about um, the very first albino reticulated python. 
the lavender. Oh, is the audio not coming through? Audio's not coming through. Okay. Well, I can narrate it. Um, basically, that was the wild caught lavender. This is on YouTube. Anyone can Google it. That was the wild caught lavender found in 1994, brought in by Anson Wong. Um, he had a very hard time acclimating to captivity. He didn't eat for two years. Um, and once he did, he produced, I think, um, Bob said hundreds of babies directly, and then he's father or grandfather and thousands. Um, and all Clark strain albinos come directly from him, which is crazy. Think of all of the um, inbreeding from that. No kidding. Yeah. And how prevalent they still are today. Yeah. I mean, it's the cornerstone for many people's collections. I know it is for mine. So yeah. thanks, Bob. You know, I can't, I can't keep what I have without. I, you could say that about anything. There. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But to, to, you know, know the people, it's kind of different. Okay. You go on the next one. Speaking of different. Different. So, um, I try to take a little selection of the different albino strains, specifically the ones that people don't know as much about. Uh, the very first photo is the sharp strain albino. Um, that was a photo from our good friend, Rodney. Shout out it's to a, Rodney. It's a bummer that that never took off, but. I know. I don't know what happened. I like them. Um, I don't have any locality data for that. It's a very cool snake, um, a, a melanistic type. How would else would you describe that? Yeah, I mean, definitely a melanistic, but as an adult, there was definitely a little more hints of orange than the just the the faint yellow as Amel's got older. So it was basically kind of from the pictures that I've seen as they grew up, it would gain more white, but the yellows would become like darker and orange almost. Mm -hmm. So it's a shame that I don't know if there are even any left. I might have seen a post in the nation a couple of years ago. Yeah, I just, I don't think that anyone's working with breeding it. them. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I remember seeing that too. The second photo is of Jay Brewer uh, of Prehistoric Pets. He's holding um, tw Twinkie, Twinkie. Yeah. Um, who was the longest albino snake in captivity. She was actually a part of that very first amelanistic clutch that hatched in 2003 when she was... She was born at Baldago's place and then sold to the original iteration of Slither Inc., where um, the Pruitt half brothers uh, called her T Rex and then mm -hmm. they sold it to Jay, who called her Twinkie. So that's the kind of an interesting history. And then she grew out to be huge. Yeah. So, um, and it's interesting to trace the history all the way back from P. Call and then to the Baldagos, to the original iteration of Slither Inc., to J, um, all from that very first A-Mail clutch. Sad that she didn't even live 20 years. Um, yeah. Um, in the third photo, we have the aforementioned Anson Wong with the very first albino retic that Bob Clark had. Um, very cool piece of history. Um, I don't know if that animal is still alive. Probably not, but... Um, and just so everyone who's watching knows, it's Anson on the, the left in that photo. Thank you. Yep. And then there were also forms of albinism that were brought in that weren't heritable. So this project went by a couple different names. I believe it was originally called Purple Pink. Someone, I think, wanted to name it Purple Hypo. Um, but it was a project that never took off. The I believe even the heterozygous animals had digestive issues. The original one was bred to a super tiger, and the project just never worked out. But uh, we often don't see the ones that didn't make it, so that's why I wanted to include that animal. Yeah, no, that's a project that you made me aware of. So that's it's a cool looking animal. So yeah. it's, it's unfortunate that they had that many issues. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, you can go to the next slide. And then onslaught of new morphs. This is where it kind of gets interesting. So all of these morphs will be very commonly known to everyone. Genetic stripe was first proven to be heritable in 2001 by Bob Clark. Um, the locality information on that animal is that it was brought in as an Indonesian uh, through work mostly by Travis Warren. It's pretty obvious that it probably came from Madura because practically every other uh, genetic stripe in the wild has been found in Madura. For some reason, the East Javans um, and then by extension Madura retics seem to be a little bit smaller. So when the original genetic stripe was brought in, it was called a dwarf um, because it was very small. Nowadays, if you buy a genetic stripe, do not think you are buying a small animal just because the original male was very small. Yeah. Unless you're buying it from Cliff. I'm sorry. <sighs> Keep going. No comment. Um, the golden child wants to... No, um, it, they... It has been claimed that golden child came from Slayer. Do you know where one was recently found? Sumatra. Yeah, right. There was a couple found in Ryu. Right. Um, <laughs> That's what the pause was for. Yeah. You're going to see me do... No, I thought he seized one. for a second. You're going to see me do three more pauses here. <laughs> um, maybe I'll just skip over the locality information. But... Um, Golden Don't Shire. do that. <laughs> Whatever, it's true. Um, Sunfire. Oh, gosh, I don't remember where the where Sunfire's been found. Um, proven in 2004. I think we should rename it Shane Fire at this point. Yeah, he's perfected it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, platinum. The story behind the Platinum is very interesting um, because it was originally... They found the white snakes and then the visual heterozygotes, which are Platinums, were brought in to through one person and then the actual white snakes were brought in through another person and they the um people that were selling them didn't know that um so there's a very interesting history that i don't want to go into because of recent events but lots of interesting history for the platinum mutation um and i mean platinum same... lemon glow fire yeah so that's a good point um the Fire and um, platinum are the exact same animals. Yep. Yep. One was called uh, fire by Bob. Uh, who called it platinum? Was it Jay? It might have been Jay. I don't remember. But they were the two that were really working with that project. And then Lemon Glow came out of the UK. Uh, and it's the same thing where Ultra Ivories don't have problems. Uh, Black Eyed Leucistics have problems. And then... What's the third that I'm forgetting? There's ivory, ultra ivory, and... Oh, I, I just ivory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think ivories have problems, right? No. No, I mean, even ultras really don't. It's just a B. Mm, just the bells. B, uh, yeah. Um, so I forget where they came from. Anthrax has been found everywhere, really, in the wild. Um, so the 2004 date when the original male was bred to poison ivy. Makes sense. Um, and then titanium, um, 2006. To Wait, 2000. did you just beat around the bush with anthrax? What did you, did you, you beat around the bush with anthrax, didn't you? Anyways, uh, I, there's been some recently, very recently found in Sumatra. Yeah. But you know, they're doors. No comment. Titanium. Titanium, not a dwarf. Um, the visual heterozygotes citron a lot of people I, do people still work with citron yeah chris just actually made a visual 50 percent superdorf uh titaniums and he he likes to hold back the citron citrons are great man citrons are are one of the the few heterozygous that that you can i mean the color just pops compared to the normals mm. i'm very 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 outdated on the morphs so if... yeah i mean people people still call them citrons um there's not a lot of people working with it like i said i think that the i mean outside of chris mcvicker producing these 50 percent superdorf titaniums 
I haven't seen anyone produce titaniums in a while. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that's the only person I know working that project. Yeah, I think they're out of fashion by now. Orange Ghost Stripe um, has been found several times in East Java. Uh, once again, the animals from East Java do tend to be a little bit smaller. Uh, that was proven to be heritable in 2008. Oh, and then I should have corrected myself. I do have the date for platinum. Um, but Motley has arisen four different times in Bob Clark's collection, which is crazy. That's wild. And also Just... once in Garrett's, right? Yeah. Oh, thank you for correcting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, once in Garrett's as well. Um, in from animals that had known no <laughs> actually technically that would have been Don Munson's. But um, Oh, yeah. All right. right. It was a, a, a joint breeding between the two. I'd have to ask Garrett. Yeah, it had that Garrett's. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so Motley seems to be one of those that just it's arises cool. a lot. So Motley is Oklahoma City locality. Um, <laughs> once again, I am old. So I knew Phantoms originally as Phantom Stripes. Um, I don't know when they were first proven heritable. Um, probably right around the same time as Orange Ghost Stripes. Um, probably another well word phantoms have been found in java and somewhere else that i'm forgetting but here nor there right. next slide please Ooh, yes world's first craze something we are still dealing with today so do you guys remember this website uh, I've, I've, I've heard of it but i never like got to visit it if you want the link i can send it to you okay. yep i discovered that in high school Ooh, I discovered other things in high school. So, um, Jesus of... Christ, his Lord and Savior. <laughs> I st never mind. I stop. I was gonna continue. That. Never mind. Um, World of Retix is listen. A you're you're you are refrained from holding back on the third series of this. <laughs> you know how much you would have to cut out that I. Don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. Oh, that's you're gonna have a project on your hands. Yeah, there would be so much editing you would have to do. I apologize profusely. I'll let you think there's gonna be a lot of editing. <laughs> I mean, you hear me on our phone calls and I don't hold back. So it's not good. Nevertheless, World of Retix is a website. Um, I believe it was created by the same people who created World of Ball Pythons. Um it Go served, oh, I know. You know how wild is that? Um, it served the same purpose, where um, it was a database of all of the different base morphs and the combinations of those morphs. Um, I remember watching the prehistoric pets videos, and then um, it would be Raffi's videos at Nerd. Those were great videos. I wonder what happened to Raffi, but nevertheless, they had a, a sidebar of those. So this is something I want to ask you guys about. We don't see this craze as much as we used to, but the effects are something we still see. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? <sighs> Nathan. Cop out. Uh, I mean, I'll let him go first because I got plenty of thoughts. No, I, 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 I do too, and Glenn and I were I, talking I about to, it before the, before I, the episode. I tend to, if, if for those of you listening, tend to know I ramble. So I want to give nathan the floor first so that anything he covers i don't have to ramble about uh i'll just talk about the one thing that bugs me about it right now uh just keep it relevant uh we see some animals with some phenotypes that uh sh maybe shouldn't be here <laughs> and people are getting all up in arms about it right um to, to a degree where it, it almost becomes like, oh, we should be blacklisting these people. They're they're no good and they're a danger to the hobby. I think we should this is, list them regardless. This, if they did nothing wrong. This has been happening since since retics have been imported and yeah. will continue to happen long after we're gone. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think the world's first craze is, you know, just marketing and, and a lot of hype. Like we're going to eventually have these animals floating around anyway. So, right. 
I think the whole world's first crazy in regards to like combos and stacking genes. And I'm sure we're going to get into it after these slides because I'm peeking ahead. But um, mm-hmm. I've All never I've, I've never liked the um, idea of gene stacking recklessly. Um, everything is very intent for me um, and has a purpose. And when you decide to just throw a bunch of morphs together, um, you end up with a lesser version of of a snake compared to the better version of the individual morph from that stacking. That probably made no sense to anybody. No, no. If if you, I mean, we, we did a whole episode on it, right? It's just, it's, it's, um, if you stack enough, um, and Glenn, I know I peeked ahead, but I would have said this anyways, if you stack enough, you end up with a solid orange or yellow snake. Um, and it looks like crap. Um, I just, Right, the, the stripe down the back, you know. Right. Um, for me, I would rather produce the best looking single or double visual gene animal and perfect it than give you a motley phantom tiger marble, uh, albino, uh, and re- like I just 50% I 50% dwarf, shut up, 50% genetic stripe dwarf, calico, right. Um, well, and so, you, see, you see people starting to do that now, which I like. Like uh, you have Weston focusing. over at Wildfire that's focusing on just creating some of the best purples that he can make based yes. off what he likes in a purple. And you right. know, why not do that yourself? Find an animal that's unique that you hatch out and try to you know build off those traits. Yeah, Sunfire wishing. Right, and I'm not yeah. trying to I'm not trying to hate on the people that that make four to five gene animals at all. But I guess what I would like to see. And uh, I'm not making the assumption that they're not doing this, but if you get to the four or five gene animal, right, you, you at that point are looking at it and you have to make a decision at which direction you're going to go with that animal in order for it to not look washed out and bad. So just be smart as you continue to progress into like the whole gene stacking that, that uh, you're, you're not, I don't know, I guess like you just got to be smart and realize which phenotypic expressions reduce color, enhance color, reduce pattern, enhance pattern, and then stack it with those that complement it. Um, when you take a pattern reducer to a pattern enhancer, you're you're going nowhere. You're not advancing in one way or the other. Anyways. Yes. Right. I mean, have you seen those old photos of Rodney's purple albinos? Dude, they were some of the best freaking yeah. purples ever. And that was a single, it was a base morph. Yeah, and that, and that's I mean it's again locality influence, and this is where you know we'll talk about I don't that. I know if there was locality influence in those. No, no, no. But I'm saying like if we want to start doing that oh, today, gotcha, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Like, can you imagine what Halmahera purples would would do? So that's what I'm saying. Like that's where I think next episode we'll talk about the importance of locality stuff and that whole thing. Um, but yeah, I just um, you know we you gotta. We got to get back to really perfecting the single and double gene animals uh, mm. because we got away from that for like two decades. And that was the downfall of the mainland retic market. Yep. Because it created a bunch of animals that were um, <laughs> monitor food. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're looking to hit, you know, one in 18 chance odds and, you know, the rest of the animals are not being sold. And, um, you know, super debatable topic that's been kind of a hot topic lately on podcasts, on forums, you know, but, but at the end of the day, um, you know, perfecting a single or double gene animal and creating a beautiful animal with those two genes is going to result in less culling, you know, and, and needless death of life that you're bringing on to, you know, yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's look at the orange snakes. So I was going to go, as Lucas said, um, you can just kind of scroll through these. Okay. Um, what happens when you are... Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Nathan, go back one. This is why I didn't scroll. Oh, I know. I will say, and I'm not going to do this with everyone, but that is a uh, that's an albino golden child. And I, I like white albino golden childs because they end up having those funky circular patterns on top. So that one, I'm not going to discredit, but I like it. Yeah, I, I was looking through my old photos to see if I could yeah. find. Um, next one, yeah, orange snake. Probably like a thousand genes in there. 
orange snake. It's yeah, probably it's like the quintessential orange snake. Right. And I guarantee you all of these are all different genes. Yeah, that's a different <laughs> snake right there. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, they're like pretty of themselves, but when you can when you end up getting to the same result using like several different type of morphs, you you know you've gone too far. Yeah, see that's that white golden jaw that I was talking about that I'm kind of a fan of. Yeah, I mean they're cool. The uh, the contrast, yeah. You right. can't I just don't think that's not going to age well. It's yeah, yeah, because the orange stools out and yeah, that's that's a hatchling, so you know it's as good as it's going to get for that snake. And these photos are probably ten years old as well. Yeah, they all look like they're from the same place, same bedding, same tubs, same Glenn. melamine enclosures. Glad. Yeah, that's. Yeah, super. See that one at least I can give it the white head. Um, you know what sucks too, and I haven't been in this position yet, but can you imagine dedicating like twelve years into a project to then end up with that result? <laughs> you know how much money, time, and effort that is. You know how many ball python breeders <laughs> you could see the Dude. same thing. Oh, there's the end. Okay, you can go back. I love that photo. I was very proud of that one. Yeah, that's a, a little grumpy snake. So and the moral of the story is with that world's first craze that we saw, and that was in the later um, aughts and then the early 2010s um, because we were able to stack those uh, base morphs. That's kind of what I uh, should have right. uh, elaborated I can't, I, on. Yeah. I can't wait until we ruin Aztec in the U.S., uh, we'll see you tomorrow. I'm sure someone's already ruined it. <laughs> I'm talking about until we completely like, you know, Aztec for like the crazy circular busy pattern and everything. We're going to be producing multiple gene Aztecs that are literally like solid. What's crazy is that there's multiple Aztecs into the U.S. No, the US from different people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the person that just posted them publicly was like, you know, there's a bunch of shit with Slither going on, so might as well go for it. <laughs> <laughs> they're like i'm not i'm not working to be honest right he's like those pictures look a lot worse than me showing this picture <laughs> off so here's my chance <laughs> nathan and i were talking about that earlier yeah there was a couple there was an emeraldo to an emeraldo breeding yeah yep. yeah so, um okay bacon retics bacon <laughs> it's bacon all right Next slide. Ah, yes. So this is really the downfall of mainland reticulated pythons. Um, had it not been for this, we still would have seen, at least for a couple more years, the intense um, morph stacking to death. But really, it was the Lacey Act that did in the mainland market. So what I wanted to do with this is I went into quite a bit of detail because people know the sentence retics are on the Lacey Act and that's uh, horribly misguided. So I want to break it down and understand the historical context behind it because this dates back to 2009. Um, and for those of you who are listening to audio, it was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, proposes listing nine species, um, and technically a subspecies, of large constrictors non-native to the U.S. Um, as injurious wildlife. So that was the Burmese python and then the Indian python, both um, python malorus, um, because it's a subspecies thing. Northern Afroc, Southern Afroc, retics. Green anacondas, yellow anacondas, benin anacondas, um, dish, not whatever, anacondas and boas. Dishonsies? What Nathan said. Uh, that, that's the closest I got. Um, Did they then, add that new subspecies of anaconda? Is that on there? The one with the E? I don't. I've never been kept up on anaconda stuff. Mm. So I would say no, because it, it probably would have just red anacondas among their subspecies. Hmm. But either way, this dates back to 2009 with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, wanting to add those species as injurious. Um, 
there was a lot of back and forth within the reptile community with fish and wildlife. They were actually working hand in hand. Uh, a lot of people forget this. Greg Grant, um, when I spoke with him, was retelling the story um, to me about how they ended up with some of these animals in the 2012 list, about how giving them Afrox was um, uh, like a give and take situation where no one really keeps Afrox. So why not let the government take it if they're going to regulate it anyway, if we can keep retics and boas. Um, and then no one can argue Burmese pythons. That's, you know, a lost cause. There's just so much data that shows how horrible they are for the environment. Um, obviously not worse than land developers or feral cats, but still in a large invasive constrictor is a large invasive constrictor. Yeah. I mean, we literally have the Florida Burmese python right now. They've been here established long enough. Yeah, for decades on decades. Or the Florida python, I should say. Yeah. Um, so they finalized that list. And then um, in 2012, that action prevented the interstate transport of berms, yellows, anacondas, um, and then both northern and southern afrocs. Can you then... imagine being a keeper and breeder when interstate commerce was banned? Oh, do you? Oh, you I mean, I, it. I mean, I, I, I remember when it happened, and I, but like, could you just imagine breeding at that yeah. time or being a keeper and them mm -hmm. doing that? Like, I yeah, panic. <laughs> I still have responses from um, my Senate, like actual legitimate responses from my senators and Congress uh, woman who I wrote to about this, um, and they weren't just the typical. Um, responses they were actually personalized someone sat down and wrote it so that was very cool yeah well they didn't have chat gpt to you know <laughs> write up an auto generated yeah, response unpaid interns could you imagine if they did that <laughs> unpaid. Jeez. um and then without getting too much into the history here us arc um, filed a lawsuit regarding the designation of those species the addition of the species under the Lacey Act is fairly controversial. I believe the, the fish and wildlife included Indian pythons range as Burmese pythons, and obviously they have different ranges. So I don't know if all of the necessary details went into that decision. So it was a very fairly easy lawsuit to file. So there was a lot at play here. And then in 2014, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife opens up public comment on the species that weren't added, and that includes retics. And then um, on March 6, they list reticulated pythons as an injurious species, and that means no interstate commerce or no interstate transfer transport and no importation. So I believe Lucas, your the parents for basil were in probably the last shipment of reticulated pythons into the U.S. Yeah, as a matter of fact, when I was talking to, I talked to Dumb Munson about that, and he felt pretty, um, he, he mentioned, you know, um, it, it that it might have been. I, no one knows specifically for sure, but I, yeah. how many other shipments came in in March of 2015? Right. Yeah. So. It's very interesting. Um, and no one, even then, it wasn't for the dwarf and super dwarfs. It was of interest, but it wasn't of major interest. I spoke with the importer about that directly. Um, right. He said he doesn't specifically remember if it was the last one because it wasn't as big of a deal. He didn't have people knocking down his door right. trying to get him in. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it seemed like there was maybe a handful of people in the country who, like, probably even less than a handful of people in the country that once this stuff happened, um, did everything that they could to try to get localities in. Mm -hmm. No one at that point still gave a shit. Look who has pure localities. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. Oh, Look who they okay. trace back to. No, exactly. Um, but But, yeah, I mean... Um, can I ask you a question, Glenn? Yes, Since sir. you've done all this research, you, you've compiled all this data and we're looking at everything on the Lacey Act. Um, or actually, hold on. We still have a few highlights. I'll, I'll table my question for the end. 
Okay. Um, and then US Arc filed temporary restraining order upon the implementation of them, um, yada, yada, yada. And then in April, they banned the importation and interstate transport. And then this is the history that gets interesting. Um, in May of 2015, the DC District Court found that US Arc was likely to succeed on the merits of um, its claim challenging the service's longstanding interpretation of interstate transport of injurious species. So that ruling set a very big precedent because it extends to more than just these nine species of interest. Um, think about zebra mussels, injurious species, interstate transport, exact same thing, but um, we're only looking at large constrictors. So because we're scared, <laughs> that decision had very wide ranging impacts. Um, and it's very interesting to learn or to research why we have interstate transport, but not importation. Because you'd think um, that if there were initially in issues with um, the addition of these species, then both fronts could have been handled. But instead, um, the lawsuit really went for the interstate transport, and the DC District Court found it had merit. Um, and then it was upheld two years later. So that's why we still have interstate transport, but why we don't have importation. Yeah. I think it's frustrating that we stopped there. But so my that's question for you. Yes, sir. Um, is what are you, what are your thoughts on on where we're at in terms of Nathan? You gotta let me know when you do that. Now we got an ugly screen just floating in here. Nathan. Oh, sorry. I thought I thought it would just pop us right back. No, uh, we're here. You don't now. you don't give me this backseat access. Hopefully, I'll have it by next episode. You'll have it by tomorrow Third on our live. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, thoughts on Lacey Act? Where we are with it? lack of importation uh or not lack but well i guess i could say lack now yeah. but well, um it is lack of importation but not lack of smuggling two very different things <laughs> right so um Legal i mean and, and as far as as retakes being on the lacy act i mean and and not going to bat to try to get them re i just want to hear your thoughts kind of on that so let us all be real retakes are an injurious species Mm -hmm. You know, as Puerto Rico, these are a large constrictor that can kill people. Theoretically, they could become established in the Everglades. I'm surprised they aren't established in the Everglades. I'm shocked. Um, really, berms are what became established because of how popular um, they were as pets. Um, mm -hmm. I've discussed. Yes, sir. Are we shocked? I mean, in the Everglades, it can get up to 100 degrees. Oh, yeah, I, did, I guess I didn't know the climate well enough. So. Retics, retics are pretty not good with heat. Captive retics aren't good with heat. You, I mean, but I, I feel like, I, I mean, we can look into the, the, the highs and lows each year in, in Indonesia and where, you know, any island, and I'm wondering, are they getting 100 plus degrees? sometimes but then you also have to keep them out the amount or you have to keep in mind the amount of water that's in the everglades yeah Just i mean they could it's keep degrees on the surface yeah they could keep themselves cool and and you know swim a lot more mm. it's they're an injury species i don't think that should be even a debate um mm -hmm. they're invasive in puerto rico obviously they could have been um invasive that i mean they could still be invasive if everyone I decided to debating. go baiting i was asking a question i even raised oh, my no, hand I, I have seen <laughs> exposed <laughs> i've seen people argue that um just that they couldn't be invasive or whatever seriously flawed argument but burmese in the everglades really are the result of um reptile keepers from as much research as i can find that's how they got there um which is a shame and i think the captive reptile community should own that um because if we played a part in it we should be able to play a part in its solutions you mean it wasn't hurricane andrew i mean it didn't help but yeah, yeah i mean that it wiped out some breeding facilities that definitely had 
Burmese, but oh, you, without a doubt, yeah, it's it's. I mean, way it contributed. It contributed, but I'm pretty sure uh, active population, like a, a yeah, established population, mm -hmm. happened in the 80s. That's the consensus that yeah. predating yeah. Andrew, there was already an established population, and then Andrew only made it worse. So we can pretend that it was out of our hands, but it wasn't. Right. Yeah. Um, right. I know that's unpopular, but oh well. Well, look at look at how many Florida reptile keepers keep their animals outside. Oh, yeah. not necessarily for better or for worse either, but if you do it yeah. right. Yeah, I mean it. It's definitely out of any other place in this country, it's the ideal place to be able to give yourself an animal an outdoor enclosure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and then as far as reticulated python importation, we haven't learned the mistakes from um before 2015 so i don't understand why um there should be a major push for importation because i rodney's argument is we should have importation but he wasn't the one making the mistakes during importation he was the one getting localities with verified information um what mistakes are you referring to just the mass importation with little regard for where they came from preserving pure locality types right right yeah um and so let's say they open up importation tomorrow, the super dwarf islands are going to be decimated, um, even though we don't need to. We already have enough in captivity. Um, if not, we can start breeding within the super dwarf islands and then to the dwarf islands. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. yeah. The reason why wild caught animals are okay is to establish a captive population. But if there's already an established captive population, there's no reason for further importation. So I, I like imports. I have an import, um, or I have a wild card, I should say, but it has to be done correctly. Yeah. I and mean, that, was, it... uh, that was lost um, on the recent morph market scandal with wild caught animals. Everyone was either up in arms or I, people were up in arms about it, but um, there was just a fundamental misunderstanding on both fronts. Yeah. I mean, I think they have their place. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Um, do, do, you know, a morph market, should they have a warning label? Absolutely. Yes. Why not? Mm -hmm. um, why, why, if you're going to be uh, uh, advertising a wild caught, then yeah, absolutely. That thumbnail, that picture should have, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, uninformed people that go on there and, and are looking for animals. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, scarlet king snakes are a great example um, that's a species that's of great interest for me but you can't find them captive bred yeah so interesting so I don't know why yeah I was just that's why I said interesting I, that, that kind of threw me for a loop yeah, so I mean, um, comment speak I know I was just going to say there's one on morph market right now so no oh. Um, so in terms of wrapping this up, um, mm -hmm. I am looking forward to the next episode. Do you mind highlighting what the next episode is going to be again? Yeah. So we're going to be looking specifically at the history of dwarf and super dwarf reticulated pythons in captivity. Once again, to define, um, dwarf and super dwarfs, we're looking at the seven, um, localities in captivity from the Slayer Island chain. So that's, uh, Slayer, Tambalongan, uh, Jampea, Kaiwadi, uh, Madu, Kalatoa, and then the Karumpas. Yeah. Um, just seven, huh? <laughs> At least that have been subclassified. <laughs> so I always try to give that forewarning. There are probably thousands of insular populations of reticulated pythons. We only have seven. I mean, we don't even have all I'm of so, them, to be honest. I'm actually so glad that you use the term insular because so many people are still so ignorant and say that you know that insular dwarfism isn't the reason right? it doesn't yeah <laughs> it's like okay sure um well i um glenn yes. super happy to have you on again happy to bring you back in a few weeks um nathan any any comments you got no we went through a lot tonight and i'm excited to see what we got next episode yeah Glenn, again, thanks for coming on and looking forward to the last segment. For those of you that are still listening, um, thank you. Bye. Bye.